Adams State College. Great stories begin here. Welcome everyone to tonight's Adams State College faculty lecture. This is the first lecture in the spring lecture series. Tonight we have Dr. Beth Bonsitter from the Department of Communications. She is a, an assistant professor of communication, singular, that right? She's in her second year here at Adams State College. She's from Denver, but she did her PhD at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. And the most interesting thing I learned about Dr. Bonsitter I'm getting ready for this talk, is that she earned her PhD in satire, parody, and Mel Brooks films. <laughs> I feel like I did something wrong. <laughs> Hopefully tonight's talk will shed some light on that. So right now, please join me in offering a warm welcome to our speaker, Dr. Beth Bonster. Well, thank you, everybody, and thank you for coming out tonight on a cold night and missing the State of the Union. Um, I, I very much appreciate it. Whoops, that was right. Whoops. See, I'm off to a stellar start, aren't I? That remote mouse gets everybody. Yep. So All right. Don't press the wheel. Use the rope the wheel. The wheel. Ah. All right. A little more about me, um, and the reason I put in a little more about me is because, um, as Robert implied, it may sound a little screwy what I do. It's like, you got your PhD in what? Um, I got my PhD, overall it's in communication, like communication studies. My uh, doctoral dissertation, however, was on Mel Brooks films. Um, the field of communication is a very vast field. It encompasses a lot, it encompasses anything having to do with human discourse, whether that's media, whether that's interpersonal communications, whether that's cultural communications, intercultural communications, whether that is rhetoric, and on and on and on. Um, so, media studies is kind of a subset of communication and that's really what I do. I do something a little bit different for those of you that were at Dr. Mark Finney's presentation last semester. I do something a little bit different than what he does. Whereas he concentrates more on the news and more on kind of a quantitative, not exactly, but a more social science approach to studying the news. I take I'm what's called a rhetorical scholar. I take a more hermeneutic look at popular culture. So, a little more about me. Like I said, my PhD is from the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities. Um, yes, it's way colder there. Um, master's from right here, CSU, Colorado State University, and in, if you're interested, I got my BA at Regis. Um, my area of interest, what I study, is satire and parody in media. How they work as rhetorical devices. And of course, there's the title of my dissertation. And like I said, I consider myself a rhetorical scholar. Right, it's right here. So what is rhetorical criticism? What does it mean to be a rhetorical scholar, particularly in media studies? What does it mean to study pop culture? Pop culture is just entertainment, right? It's just fun. Wrong. <laughs> Dismiss that notion right now. One of the first things I tell my students is that it is never just entertainment. That media is one of the most powerful socializing institutions we have. It socializes us every bit as much as family, education, religion, government. So what we see and hear on TV, while it may not be what's called a magic bullet, it may not be I watch a violent show and then now I'm violent, it nonetheless teaches us about the, the culture that we're in. It teaches us about society's values. Which is why it's important when something is sexist or racist or heterosexist that we respond to it, that we recognize it, that we not advocate that kind of programming because we are socialized, we are being taught that these values are okay if we advocate that kind of programming. We're being taught anyway if it's being shown. Um, but also, it's important to recognize the good stuff. It's important to recognize when media is teaching us positive values. And it's important to recognize when media is critical, when media is making what's called a rhetorical statement. Now by rhetorical, I don't mean something like a rhetorical question. 
And I don't mean rhetoric in the sense that we hear the everyday word, like so-and-so politician is full of rhetoric. You know, that's not what it means in this discipline. In this discipline, although a precise definition is not agreed upon, essentially rhetoric means discourse. And specifically, it means persuasive discourse. So to take a rhetorical perspective means that I and you know, folks like me are concerned with how discourse shapes reality. How the words we speak, how language, and make no mistake, media texts are a language. Not a separate language like you know, English or Spanish or whatever, but it's, it, it tells us something, it communicates something, it persuades us of something. And rhetorical scholars and communication scholars in general believe that really the only way we understand the world around us is through language. Now that's not to say that a world doesn't exist outside of language, like water or that stuff that we have labeled water. Yeah, that's still out there without language. But the only way we as human beings can understand it, the only way that we are able to deal with it, to give it meaning, is through language. We are capable of symbolic thought. We are able to attach symbols, like an M, you know, is a M mm sound that means certain things. Chomsky argues that we may even be hardwired for it. So, Human beings really only understand the world around them through discourse. I mean, it's, we can't even really imagine what the world around us is like without discourse. That's how absorbed and involved we are in discourse and how much it shapes our reality. And TV, film, websites, etc., are discourse, as is all narrative, books, you know, anything. These are all discourse too. They're speech too. They're ways of communicating, too. And actually, everything is rhetoric. Um, any, anything. And by rhetoric, I mean specifically persuasive. Kenneth Burke would argue that pretty much everything we do is in some way persuasive. So not only are we talking about discourses and communication, we're talking about discourse as persuasion. The fact that you chose to talk about something Makes, means that you're persuading us that it is important to talk about. The fact that you don't talk about something has a similar meaning. You know, the fact that you choose one word over another word is persuasive. So, the point is, how we understand a word is an effect of these, of these linguistic choices. How we understand the world is an effect of discourse, of effective language. And therefore, in a rhetorical perspective, we kind of throw out the idea of objectivity. Like, rhetorical scholars do not really believe in objectivity. You know, even in science, even in science, the fact that you're conducting the experiment changes the experiment a little bit. So, okay, if we can't be objective, we nonetheless can still view and evaluate how discourse works. Maybe not objectively. Maybe we're still, you know, affecting the results. Our, our own little biases are still in there, our own persuasive choices, our own word choices. But nonetheless, we can still do a fairly good job of evaluating how discourse shapes reality and how it works. So, what I do as a rhetorical scholar is I ask the question, how do different pieces of pop culture operate rhetorically? That's kind of the broad question that I ask. How does pop culture operate rhetorically? In my personal case, I'm very interested in parody and satire, specifically, in comedy. But there are other pieces of pop culture, too, that I might ask the same thing of. All right, so one of the questions I get from students quite a bit is, why study comedy? It's just funny. It's just comedy. It's just a movie. It's just silliness. Well, if, you know, if you've been paying attention, you probably can guess my answer. No, it's not. No, it's not. Um, it's never just entertainment. And comedy can be not only the mo one of the most persuasive forms of uh, mediated discourse that we have, it can also be one of the sneakiest. 
It can slip in unnoticed. It can persuade us in ways that we don't notice. So studying comedy is really about that. And it can do a lot of other things too. It can reveal the world and comment on the human condition in society. I mean, think about things like the old Charlie Chaplin movies when he would, uh, like uh, High Times, is that what it's called? I'm not remembering off the top of my head. Um, when he would comment on the social conditions of workers. But he, he would do so using slapstick. You know, he'd be caught in the cogs or whatever. It can tell us about the human condition. Um, the very fact that we laugh at slapstick in and of itself is an interesting rhetorical message. The fact that we laugh at somebody beating the crap out of somebody is itself interestingly rhetorically. And it can tell us a lot about ourselves. And humor in particular is what we call a rhetorical device. It's something that's put in, you know, humor by and large is not accidental in text. Now the reason I say by and large is there, there are occasions when it is. We have names for some of those texts. For instance, something called Paracinema, which is one, some, a film that's so bad it's good. And it gets, uh, it gets uh, a following. The latest one to come out of any, uh, of any note is one called The Room. And it's this film that was made in 2003, and the shots are out of focus, and the acting's really terrible, and the plot makes no sense. And young people are lining up around the block to see this thing. I mean, and they laugh at it, and they throw things at it, and they interact with it. The guy who made that probably, Tommy Wiseau, probably did not intend, he says he does now, but we'll talk about why intent is also not really a strong factor. Um, probably did not intend it to be funny, but it became funny. That's paracinema. Camp is another type of text that may or may not be intentionally funny, depending on if the camp is intentional or not. Some camp is, some camp is not. But by and large, humor is an intentional device. And the reason, um, well, let me, let me back up just a sec. So in other words, it operates as discourse, persuasion, and argument. You know, humor is put in there and the, that the author wants you to laugh at something makes it highly rhetorical. Not just rhetorical, highly rhetorical. Now, I'm about to say something that's going to sound like I'm just about to contradict myself here. The thing is, that be that as that may, be that as it may, that humor is an intentional device. We nonetheless, when we study humor, we really don't examine intention. It's what's called the intentional fallacy. We look at the text itself. And the reason is, we can't ever really fully know, really fully know, why someone did what they did, or if they intended to. So we can read their interviews. We can make some conclusions from it. We can make arguments from it. But ultimately, we can't really know. When Woody Allen says that he intends to do this, this, or this in his text, he could be putting us on for all we know. Maybe, maybe not. This becomes especially true with somebody who's a filmmaker who habitually puts us on who is all the time putting on people. So that's one reason. The other reason is sometimes intent simply doesn't matter. Sometimes when, when somebody intends it to have one message, intends a text to have one message, and by text I mean not just books, not just poetry, but film, TV, websites, anything. Pretty much anything in the media is a text. Um, they may or may not have intended it to come out with a certain message, but it does anyway. To give a non-comedic example, how many of you are familiar uh, with the song Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds? What's that song about? LSD. LSD. John Lennon before, before he died, would swore that it was not about LSD and Paul McCartney. They swear it's not about LSD. It's about a picture that one of their kids drew. 
Does it matter? Not in the least. The point is that people have taken it and made it mean LSD, or they read into it that it meant LSD. What, Jul what John Lennon and Paul McCartney intended at this point is kind of irrelevant. Well, I mean, we can argue, but that's not what that song means. It doesn't matter. All that matters is what we as a, how we as a society interpret it. Because that's the message we're getting. That's what we're being socialized into. So that's why we can't really worry about intention at this point. We have to worry about what the text itself is doing. So we look at the text. So, humor is a, one of the most powerful por forms of persuasion. Not only can comedy, and I'm using the terms comedy and humor very interchangeably here, and I'll talk about that in a second. Humor and comedy can be one of the most powerful methods of persuasion. So not only does comedy teach us about the human condition, explain society, um, it can also be an extremely powerful form of persuasion because it's funny, it's pleasurable, it's enjoyable. We like it, it makes us feel good. And therefore, it can, some, it can do its work without being noticed. It's kind of like ideology at that point. You know, ideology works best when you don't know it's working. Humor the same way. If I want to persuade you of something, and you might disagree with me, but I make you laugh with my persuasive message, you're more likely to slip in, to start agreeing with me, to become more sympathetic with me, to start identifying with me or identifying with my message. This is one reason why I took up studying humor, besides the fact that it allowed me to make a career watching Mel Brooks movies. Um, <laughs> It's because it's very important to me that students understand this and that you know, students of all ages understand this, that just because it's funny doesn't make it okay. So, not all humor, including satire, and we'll talk about that in a minute, is positive. Some of it can be very socially damaging, very repressive, carry other unwanted cons consequences that one of the classic examples, um, and by cl I don't mean classic as in good, positive social value, I mean classic as in well-known examples, is that of the Nazis. The Nazis used to make films that satirized, if you will, the Jews. Is that progressive? Is that good? Do we want that in our society? No. So. Humor can do its work very subtly. It, you probably could all think of a time when you saw something on TV that was supposed to be funny that actually offended you. Humor is not always positive. And one of the, my goals as a scholar is to get people to know why they're laughing. I'm not, you know, I was asked once, well, what you do, you know, how can you do that? Because if you have to explain a joke, it's not funny. Well, I disagree. I disagree. I think that in the process of explaining the joke, it becomes funnier. If you know why you're laughing, if you understand why it's funny, if you understand the cultural context behind the joke, it becomes that much more pleasurable. There are some pieces, some types of comedy that may not be funny anymore once you start studying comedy. I can no longer watch or even stand the movie Miss Congeniality. I, I used to like it before I went to grad school. And now I think it's the most sexist piece of, you know, whatever. I mean, I just can't watch it. So some types of comedy, no. Yeah, it is ruined for me. But other types of comedy, I have richer appreciation for Mel Brooks. I have a richer appreciation for Woody Allen. I have a richer appreciation for South Park, for The Simpsons. So know why you're laughing. And that's really why I got interested in this topic, to teach students to be able to critically think through comedy. So, for some reason, I duplicated that slide. I'm having all sorts of PowerPoint fun tonight, aren't I? All right. So that's a little bit of background about why I do what I do. Of course, I didn't talk, name this talk tonight why I do what I do. I named it the many sides of satire. So that's what we're going to talk about from this point forward. 
There, one of the things, the well, directions I'm kind of going post-dissertation is I'm starting to notice a trend in communication and in academia. This trend of putting comedy into discrete little categories. It's satire, it's parody, it's farce, it's burlesque, it's this, it's that. For the sake of doing so, there doesn't seem to be any reason for it other than to put it in categories and, and publish and get tenure. Um, and these scholars will, will defend strongly, well that is not satire, that is not satire. And if you think that's satire, then you don't understand what satire is. And then in a different book, no, 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 this is satire. And if you think that, you don't, well, I call BS. Um, I don't, the, the reason I'm, the, the line of thought I'm getting into now and the work that I'm starting to do now is to kind of get past this idea of putting satire into categories or putting comedy into categories simply for the sake of doing so. Like, I can understand it to be able to point to students the differences, the subtle differences that you can see in different types of comedy. But I don't see it just for the sake of being able to publish it and my, what a good scholar am I. I mean, it's kind of a waste of time to me. For one thing, there's disagreement over what each of these categories constitute depending on who you're reading. Umberto Eco would categorize humor one way and comedy another that's completely opposite of the way Bakhtin does it. Um, Freud had a completely different definition for humor. And those are the old guys. The, the current, current communication scholars are even more picky about this is this and that is that. Parody is not satire and satire is not parody and never should tell the two meet. Even though in real life and in real satire and real parody, that's rarely ever true. You know, the two are used together all the time. And in fact, there's even a disagreement as to what the definition of humor and comedy is. Well, comedy is humor and humor does this and comedy does this well. My opinion is that we need to get past this. You know, we're playing linguistic games. And yes, definitions do matter. And I'm not denying that. But we need to, rather than base our definitions on simple topographies um, and then defend these topographies simply for the sake of doing so, or trying to come up with the end-all, be-all definition of any type of comedy, the better question, and this is heavily influenced by my advisor, Ed Schiappa at the University of Minnesota, the, who's doing a lot of work in definitional argument, the better question is to say, how does it work? What does it do for us? How is it operating? How is it operating as rhetoric? So that rather than saying, this is satire, none of you other guys come in, let's instead say, in text A, what satiric discourse is going on that's accomplishing B goal or C goal? And so one of the things I argue is that satire, picking one of these categories, satire is the one I uh, focus my attention on the most, operates in many ways. I mean, if you think about it, if you ask somebody about The Simpsons, they might say it satirizes sitcoms. Well, a lot of communication scholars would say, ah, 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 it parodies. Hair split. Um, the point is in our everyday discourse and in the discourse outside of academia, and I'm very interested in bringing academia beyond the classroom. Um, in the world outside of academia, peop everyday people do not split hairs like that. They use the terms parody and satire interchangeably. And so trying to defend these two as separate categories is kind of a waste of time in my opinion. Plus it's been done to death. You know, I have a bunch of books on parody and satire and every single one of them swear to God that parody and satire are not the same thing, but have a little bit different inflections on what the differences are. The point is we need to really only use the categories as much as they're useful to us in understanding how they work. And satire, and a lot of, you know, satire operates in many ways. 
And so that's what I'm going to do now, is talk about some of the ways that satire operates in TV and film. This is a sampling. These are the ones I've come up with so far. This is not an exhaustive list. One of the things I tell my students is I'm, I try not to be an essentialist, an absolutist. Um, because to say, you know, I, I try not to be, and I, I never want to say that there aren't exceptions, or I rarely want to say there aren't exceptions. I rarely want to, you get it. Um, <laughs> because to do so is itself an absolutist statement. But these are some of the ways satire operates. It's not an exhaustive list. And as I go forward with this research, I'll, I might find others. But this is a start. So we might think of satire as going into one little box. Well, Jon Stewart and The Daily Show, that's satire. What Stephen Colbert does to mostly Fox News commentators, that's satire. Although I would argue that he goes after Keith Oberman just as much. Maybe not in terms of political opinions, but in terms of mannerisms. You know, that's satire, nothing else. Anything else is farce or something else. Well, I say no. Because we're seeing satire pop up in all sorts of interesting ways. And the first way is what I call ironic satire. This is what we might think of most as satire. By irony, and I, there, have, there are different kinds of irony. But by irony, I'm primarily talking about, in this context, and the way I'm defining it here, is doing something and meaning the opposite. So, how many of you are familiar with All in the Family? Okay. Um, or Stephen Colbert. Let's look at both. So when Archie Bunker stands up there and says every racial slur under the sun, it's meant to be, the text is meant to mean the opposite. We are invited by the text to laugh at Archie Bunker. When Stephen Colbert makes fun of these, acts like a Fox News commentator or MSNBC News commentator, especially during his interviews. I love during, right before his interviews, how he runs back and forth on the set and the camera's on him and it's just all about him, not the guest. You're meant to think the opposite. The text is inviting you to laugh at that behavior. Now, any, you can probably begin to see a problem here. Um, what if the viewer doesn't get the irony? It is a fact that viewers sometimes don't. Um, a very landmark study in communications by Vidmar and Rokish, um, I might be pronouncing that wrong, might be Rokish, uh, went out and asked several viewers of All in the Family and found out that a good percentage of these viewers actually thought Archie Bunker was talking to them. They didn't laugh at Archie Bunker. They were like, Oh, that's gr it's great that Archie, on, on, Archie Bunker is on. Finally, somebody, somebody who agrees with me. Horrifying, right? <laughs> Terrifying, but true. There's a lot of folks who think Stephen Colbert is an arch conservative. <laughs> they do. They think Stephen Colbert is a, a political commentator with highly conservative, uh, highly little bit, not even conservative, a little bit weird values. And they love him for it. That's one kind of satire. I'm going to show you a clip um, from a Mel Brooks film, because I love me my Mel Brooks, um, that very much relies on irony. Uh, I'll show only about five minutes of it. It goes on longer than that. Um, but it's, a f it's, it's one of the most common kinds of satire, and then I'll discuss it for just a sec. So. And I don't know what the line is. I'm going to go forward just a little bit. 
There's a language, by the way. Okay. Pay attention to the behavior of the king. Okay. So, Mel Brooks was playing King Louis the Sixteenth. Um, this is from a film in which he kind of traces the history of the world, or selected bits of it, um, <laughs> depending on his fancy. I taught a, a class on Mel Brooks um, one summer while I was at Minnesota. And I showed this film to my students. And my female students were appalled. They were fear they're like, he hates women. This is terrible behavior towards women. And I said, considering the message of the film, and what ends up happening is the king gets replaced by a doppelganger, who's also played by Mel Brooks. And he ends up saving, he's a good guy. He ends up saving the woman's father. Um, and then ends up escaping with her and all is well. Um, it's way funnier than that, but I won't get into it right now. Um, I said, considering the message of this movie, and yes, Mel Brooks movies do tend to be guy films. They do tend to not exactly be feminist manifestos. <laughs> but, but do you really think that Mel Brooks is advocating this kind of behavior? No, they said. And I would agree. 
In fact, I argue in my dissertation that this portrayal of King Louis is a satiric criticism of power. This combined with Dom DeLuise's earlier portrayal in the film of Nero, Caesar Nero, Nero Caesar, Caesar Nero, however you want to put it, um, that it's a scathing portrayal of power and the abuses state divine power have had over the years. When you consider this came out in 81, which was just at the beginning of the Reagan era, um, I think he was elected in 80, I want to say, you know, this could, this, this could be a warning call or a concerned statement about, you know, where power was going in the U.S. It could be. But the point is, it was very reliant on irony. And if you didn't get the irony, as many of my students didn't, then it became, oh my gosh, Mel Brooks is one dirty old man. <laughs> Which I'm not saying he's not, I don't know, but I tend to think not. But that's not the only kind of satire that's out there. There is non-ironic satire. Satire that isn't dependent on irony, that is very straightforward with its message. Mel Brooks made a film several years later, about 10 years later, in the early 90s, called Life Stinks. That was very clear whose side he was on. There was no irony. You were meant to identify with the homeless. And there's another film, if I can cue it up fast, that um, also uses non-ironic satire. And that's the film Office Space. How many of you have seen Office Space? It's a good film. It's a li and it, I worked in an office, well actually I worked in four different offices, for the four years between college and grad school. And let me tell you, it is the truth. Sad but true. It's not going up and I don't know why. We've got it turned up pretty high. Come on. Slow, slow, slow. Now watch it blow us out of the water here. That one. Makes sense. Okay, I think we got the volume. We definitely have the volume taken care of. I mean, this beginning itself is kind of satiric. <laughs> Not language selection. And this is me expressing myself. All right, so this is not particularly ironic, but it's no, no less satiric. Wow. Our last day in Antioch. I can't believe they have security has got us out. Not like we're going to steal something. I stole something. Oh yeah, I guess we all do. Yeah, I stole something else. What did you steal? Call it going away present. Ha <laughs> ha
All right. <laughs> so this type of satire doesn't necessarily rely on irony. In the whole film, you're invited to identify with Peter Gibbons, who's the main character who stole the printer, and Michael, who is the one beating it with his fist, and S Samir. But I hate it when my students do that. I'm not going to do it. Um, but it instead relies on illusion. You have to, in order for that scene to be, well, I mean, it seemed to be funny, two things have to happen. A, you, you, you got to understand why a printer can cause that much aggravation. <laughs> <laughs> Our printer just went out, done, on the second floor of the ES building um, that like five of us in a row share. I want to do that to it. <laughs> but I think I'll have to beat Finney to it. Um, <laughs> And, but second, you have to understand that that's allusion to a lot of the gangster films that came out in the early and mid-1990s. Like, scenes like that were very common in those films. So here, irony is not necessarily at play. It's something else. It's illusion. There's satire that implicates society versus satire that implicates individuals. Now, I, in my dissertation, I have very specific theories and theoretical words I use for that. I will spare you. Um, it was a dissertation. Um, satire that implicates society is rebuilding. It's what Kenneth Burke calls comic frame, the comic frame, or what Bakhtin might call the carnivalesque. Okay, I didn't spare you. Um, it's satire that instead of says, you individual are bad and let's make fun of you, it says, this is a problem in society. And let's, let's laugh at the individual, but let's welcome him or her back into society. Let's rehabilitate them. Let's correct the problem. The classic example of this is Blazing Saddles. <laughs> Blazing Saddles, we are clearly positioned to identify with Bart. Um, but Bart doesn't condemn the people of Rockridge. Instead, he teaches them to be better people. The film does not condemn individual people for doing dumb things. We're dumb. We do dumb things. But instead says, OK, look, this, this behavior, racism, has got to stop. And here's why it's got to stop. But there's other type of satire that does implicate individuals that's condemning. In my uh, dissertation, I argue that History of the World Part One is that kind of satire. It's, it's more likely to condemn these individual powers. You know, condemn Caesar, condemn Louis, condemn these certain things and make fun of these people and not welcome them back into society. Kenneth Burke calls this burlesque. Um, it, makes, it makes fun of the individual, puts them down, but really doesn't Say, well, you know what? You're part of society, and part of society, and society is dumb. So, let's welcome you back into society and correct the problem. Burke would argue, and I would agree, that satire that implicates society versus implicating individuals is the more progressive of the two. Though there are times when it doesn't work, when you have to use the other one. So, it's while it's more humane to say, okay, look, we're all idiots. Um, Let's correct the behavior and come back. As uh, Cherie Carlson points out, um, in the 19th century, a lot of feminists and women um, who may or may not have identified as feminists wrote in the comic style, wrote in the implicating society style, and found themselves just kind of spinning their wheels. It wasn't until they started the more scathing, the more angry attacks, the burlesque attacks, the, the attacks of individuals, the attacks that don't welcome back into society that they began to make any progress. So there are times when each are useful. I tend to lean myself towards favoring the formal, but understanding that there are times when the latter is just simply must be done. And of this, these particular categories, another is progressive versus regressive, and it's kind of the reason I got into this to begin with. 
You know, there's satire that builds up, that helps us be better individuals. All of Mel Brooks' satire, I think, my opinion, is progressive satire. It wants to see a better society. You know, it, it's things that correct us and make us better on a social value. Except what he does with women, but I'm not sure he satirizes women per se. Um, versus regressive. Satire that actually is detrimental to society. Things like the Nazis making fun of the Jews during World War II and the Holocaust. You know, you can probably think of examples today. The one that I think of is uh, when President Obama was running for election. Uh, a piece came out about him, and I forget the author of the piece, but it was discussing kind of the more subtle shades of the race issue in the election. Well, some doofus took this and made it into a song that essentially made fun of black people and the, uh, made fun of the African American experience in United States politics and how, you know, whining, you know, they're whining, they're not, they're, oh, it's all about me, oh, why should Obama get it when I, I've been the, you know, all sorts of horrible stuff that basically reinforced, I mean, it, it really marginalized the, uh, marginalized the reality of being marginalized in society. And it really made it sound, it basically imp implicated African American activists for being a bunch of whiners. Regressive. It does happen. It is out there. And what really got me going on this was when I read in uh, one of my communication books, if it's not progressive, it's not satire. Well, sorry folks, that's great in academia. It's not the reality of our world. The reality of our world is satire can be good or bad. It's a rhetorical device. Just like a technology, it can be used for a lot of different things. So these are just six ways that satire can operate. And the thing about categories, I always try to warn my students, is that categories are really created for us to better understand things. That in reality, category, cate categories are blurry. They overlap, they bleed into each other. For instance, um, there are some who make a very strong distinction between parody and satire. Well, there is some parody that isn't real strong in its implication of things. But parody and satire are used together more than they're not. Parody being a making fun of, text, of a text, a text making fun of another text broadly speaking. But already, as a person in this room pointed out to me um, during my summer class, that in and of itself is problematic because in making fun of the other text, isn't it satirizing it on some level? And communication scholars would argue and say, well, but it's, you know, it doesn't have the bite, it, isn't, it doesn't have the venom, it doesn't have the need for change. Well, that's not the point. The point is, in everyday use, we still see it. And we, you know, we see satire and parody used together so much. Think of the entire run of Chappelle's show. You know, he used lots of parody, but most of it was satirizing racial discourse, interracial discourse, sometimes for good, sometimes for bad. So ultimately, does it really accomplish much for students and other academics to adhere to rigid definitions? And I would argue, just to conclude here, rather than enforcing strict typ typographies, we should do something better with this knowledge. Rather than thinking of individual texts as, this is a satire, this is a parody, and neither the, never the two shall meet, we need to recognize that film and TV comedies have multiple elements of all sorts of different kinds of comedy and other things going on in them. Film and television are very complex pieces of discourse much more complex than, you know, one written piece of paper. They've got sound, they've got dialogue, they've got lighting, they've got blocking, they've got this, that, and the other. And so we need to recognize that a lot of things may be going on. There may be one that's more dominant than another, but a lot of things are going on. And we need to, rather than talk about, you know, this is a satire, this is a parody, recognize the rhetorical message or messages of the satiric, parodic, or whatever elements we're looking at in the text, 
What are they doing? What are they advocating? What are they trying to persuade us of? We need to understand what these texts are advocating and not advocating and how we can use them to better society. For some texts, that may mean playing up the positive elements, like in Mel Brooks. Yes, it's problematic how he portrays women. But how he criticizes power, how he criticizes racism, how he criticizes um, World War II, how he criticizes Nazi Germany, these are important, and it's more important to play up those. For some texts, maybe there's nothing we can play up. I personally think misgeniality is completely worthless. <laughs> um, so if we can't, learn how to recognize and not support these negative texts. So the whole point here, do I have one more? Yeah. So in other words, we, my argument, my kind of whole point for this whole thing is we need to concentrate less on the definitions of humorous devices and more on what they do in media context. Rather than saying satire is X, we say what constitutes satire in context Y and why does it matter? Thank you. Do we have any questions for our speaker? I've, I've heard that uh, the Stephen Colbert and uh, the other guy that does the news, John Stewart, satire, John Stewart, can get away with telling truths which the normal news channels don't. Do you agree with that? I think it's possible, but we have to recognize that it's truths as they are rhetorically framing it. Um, to someone who is very conservative, it may not be a truth. That having been said, comedy is very useful for saying things that we can't say directly. Um, we can laugh at something that we otherwise can't talk about comfortably. So in that aspect, yeah, I would agree with it. So I would agree with it, but with qualifications. I wanted to ask you, because I know you're a huge fan of Conan O'Brien, um, how do you see um, late night comedy fitting into the satire of I mean, it really depends on the show. And it depends on what the particular comedian is doing. I really think, you know, even though the genre is the same, and, you know, they come out, they do a monologue, they do a sketch, that's where the similarities end. Yeah, I, I think somebody like Jay Leno is far less satirical. His, I mean, he has some satire. 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 I mean, again, what does it do? Whether than saying, what, is it parody, is it satire, what does it do? I think Jay Leno, my personal opinion, you do not have to agree with me, I haven't sat down and done an analysis, but I find his comedy to be far less innovative. Far more easy political joke. Easy put down joke. I would almost call him burlesque or uh, condemning comedy. Where I haven't watched a lot of David Letterman lately, so I can't really say. Whereas someone like Conan O'Brien, I think it operates far less in the satirical realm to begin with. And when he does, it tends to operate more in this regenerative comedy, this parodic comedy. Whereas Craig Ferguson almost never. I mean, not, maybe not almost never, but not a whole lot is in the realm of satire at all. The satiric elements are played down in his comedy. So, and it's more about parody and wit, um, or, you know, satire of the absurd. I mean, these are not exclusive and limited categories. So, for me, it really depends on whose show you're watching. As a genre, as a genre, it's simply, genre is simply the vehicle. I'm not real strong on genres being that. I mean, they're important, but I think, it more, again, what's more interesting is what's going on within the individual texts. Does that answer your question? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How do you think Mel Brooks is going to hold up? It's hard to say. Um, that's the simple answer. <laughs> The harder answer is it depends on how we, as a society, continue to react to his kind of comedy. Right now, it looks like we're moving towards more burlesque type comedy, 
more individually implicating, more uh, you know, laughing at, not laughing with, less corrective. And so in that aspect, he might look very hokey. The other problem with Mel Brooks is he's very subtle about his political implications in his comedy. You know, with the exception of Blazing Saddles, which is pretty, you know, fairly obvious. Something like, a lot of people just think of Mel Brooks as, and I realize this is an overgeneralization, but think of Mel Brooks as just parody or as, you know, just entertainment because he is so subtle and so sociological, sociological about his comedy and his criticism. So will I think that it'll hold up in terms of being funny? Yeah. I mean, bathroom humor really never goes out of style. <laughs> <laughs> but um, will his social message hold up? I think it may or may not. And it all depends if we continue down this sort of cynical postmodern path that we're taking right now. It's a speculation on my part. Last year or two, they played um, Blazing Saddles on AMC, and it's like totally pointless because they cut out yeah. all the, the language that makes it funny. It's very it's just pointless to watch. Yeah, Mel Brooks has commented on that. Um, the comment he made about 15 years ago is that political correctness is killing comedy. And this goes back to the earlier question about talking about things that we're not comfortable about talking about straightforward. When we start really imposing, I mean, th there's a certain extent to which it's not politically correct. It's simply not being regressive, right? It's, it's not being racist. It's, but there's this extent to which we have to be politically in incorrect in, ever, in order to point out the political incorrectness. I mean, in order to implicate the horror of the N-word, Mel Brooks in that film and Mel Brooks, Richard Pryor, and, his, and the staff of writers had to use it. Had to, or otherwise, it was exactly what you said. It was completely pointless. You had to hear how wounding that word was, how awful that word was in Blazing Saddles in order to get it, to get the message. The questions? Let's thank our speaker one more time. Adams State College, great stories begin here.